Hello everyone, welcome to IAS Baba's 60 days rapid revision series for PLIMS 2022. This is day 45 and we take up economics. So the indices and other government schemes are the topics of discussion today. And before going to that, we take up the guessworks as usual. So here consider the following statements. St. Francis Xavier was one of the founding members of Jesuit order. Then St. Francis Xavier died in Goa and a church is being dedicated to him there. And the feast of St. Francis Xavier is celebrated in Goa each year. So here the statements are purely factual. So we cannot identify any extreme words here. And only one thing is like we might have read in the newspapers that is the feet of the St. Francis Xavier. So even if you say that three is correct, we are having three options here B, C and D and we cannot eliminate any of them. But however, if you go with the knowledge, so this is given in the Indian Express explained page. So here we can see the body of saint was brought from St. Paul's church that is the then Portuguese and to Basilica of Bon Jesus. So actually he died in Portuguese and from there it was brought. So again friends, it is the combination of the luck plus the logic and the hard work that will fetch you the success in films. So here the knowledge was the easiest path rather than the guesswork. And if we haven't read it, so better to leave it rather than taking risk here. Then come to next with reference to the history of ancient India, consider the following statements. So Mitakshar was the civil law for the upper castes and Dayabhag was the civil law for the lower castes. Then in the Mitakshara system, the sons can claim the right to property during the lifetime of the fathers, whereas in Dayabhaga it is only after the death of the father that the sons can claim the right to the property. Then Mitakshara system deals with the matters related to the property held by male members only of a family, whereas the Dayabhaga system deals with the matters related to property held by both male and female members of a family. So here friends, if you go with the meaning of the words, we can bog down to the answer. Say for example, Mitakshar. So what is Mitakshar? So jo mit gahe hai, unka akshar. So people who write something before they die, so that can be called as Mitakshar. Say for example, it can be the will of a property. I write before I am dying. So that is Mitakshar. And what is Dayabhag? So Dayabhag is a part of property that someone gives out of Daya, out of kindness. So for that one need not die. So here, if you consider the second statement, it is like Mitakshara is one where the person he writes before his death and Dayabhaga is one which a person writes during his lifetime. So here the statements are interchanged. So two we consider as wrong. So in that case, E and B will be eliminated and only the C and D will be remaining. And here all our options that box down to whether statement one is correct or not because three is present in both. And here Mitakshar was the civil law for the upper caste and Dayabhag for the lower castes. So again, the meaning of these words will not convey anything regarding the castes. It only conveys regarding various situations in which the property can be inherited. So if you go in that direction, so D3 only will be the option. Friends, various lawmakers or philosophers or historians, they have been coming up with their own answers. But given in the exam situation, so everyone can come up with a proper answer if we have a book inside the exam hall. So that we don't have. So given as a student, so inside the exam hall, so three only can be the best possible answer we can. And if you had hit three, so it is the best approach we have given to that question. So forget about the answer key if you have done that. Then come to next, the money multiplier in an economy increases with which one of the following? So here, an easy question. So with the increase in banking system, it increases. So one need not take pride by attempting this question correct. Then. Come to next, with reference to Indian economy, demand pull inflation can be caused or increased by which of the following. So here demand pull inflation occurs only when we supply money into the economy. So here search for options which will supply money to the economy. Say expansionary policy, yes it will supply money to the economy. So one has to be there. Then fiscal stimulus, when government gives money to the economy, even then it increases demand pull inflation. So take it. Then inflation indexing wages. So when the wages are not indexed for inflation, so even during the inflation, I keep on getting the same wage. But if my wages are indexed for inflation, so if there is a hike in inflation, so my wages will automatically be reduced. So hence inflation indexing wages will not improve or will not increase the demand pull inflation. So we will cut this. So we search for one, two and not three. So one, two and not three is present only in A. 
So 1, 2, and 4 only will be the formidable option. Even you need not read the other options also. Then with reference to India, consider the following statements. So here the retail investors through DMAT account can invest in treasury bills and government of India debt bonds in the primary market. And then the negotiated dealing systems order matching is a government securities trading platform of the Reserve Bank of India. Then the Central Depository Service Limited is jointly promoted by the Reserve Bank of India and Bombay Stock Exchange. So here friends, that is like the Central Depository Service Limited is a public sector undertaking. So why a private body should promote this Central Depository Service Limited? So if you're thinking that perspective, so three will be eliminated. So C and D went and we have only A and B that is one and one and two only. And here friends, we have read in the current affairs like earlier the treasury bills were amenable to be purchased only by the bankers and companies in the primary market but now even the retailers can purchase it in the primary market and where they can they can do it in the nds om that is the negotiated dealing system order matching so here the crude logic and the knowledge both of them they do it end to fetch the success so here we can say that two is correct statement and one and two only becomes a formidable option. With reference to water credit, consider the following statements. So first one, it puts microfinance tools to work in the water and sanitation sector. And then it is a global initiative launched under the aegis of World Health Organization and the World Bank. Friends here, water credit is something to harness the sustainable use of water. So that is more related to environment and ecology. So why the World Health Organization will come and interfere into the environment and ecology sector. So most probably this second statement will be wrong. And if we try eliminating, so if you eliminate two, one and three will be the formidable options. So here we can see UN Water has sponsored this and not the WHO. Okay, so even if you don't read the other statements, you can get the answer. So these are today's guessworks. Then come to next. The Global Fuel Economy Initiative. So according to the GFEI 2021 report, the global goal to haul the fuel consumption of new light duty vehicles by 2030 from the 2005 levels is stalling. So that means according to GFEI, they had a target that compared to 2005 levels by 2030, we will haul the fuel consumption or we will improve the fuel efficiency of engines by 50%. And here the report says that target is not going to be achieved. The reason is because the average rated fuel consumption of the new light duty vehicles fell by only 0.9% between 2017 to 2019. So here it means like the pace in which the reduction in consumption is going on is very less to reach the target. This 0.9% is very less. And then about GFEI, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative is a collaboration between the UNEP, then IEA, then the University of California, the International Council on Clean Transportation, and then International Transport Forum and FIA Foundation. So here, take it as an assignment and do a brief research on all these organizations. So to what extent they are profit, not for profit, and how they are linked to United Nations, so all those. And then coming to the targets, friends here, the GFEI, it gives various targets like we will reduce the fuel consumption of light duty vehicles by 50% by 2030 and by 90% by 2050 and all these. And they also have the various targets for heavy duty vehicles, then transit buses and others. So it is not only for the light duty vehicles. So for all other things, they have different, different targets. And then the GFEI promotes fuel efficiency in cars and light duty vans. And their target is that is 50% by 2030 and 90% by 2050. And GFEI promotes the introduction of cleaner energy, more energy efficient vehicles and others. And it also offers support to the governments to develop fuel economy policies. So this is a brief account on GEFI. Then the Vandan Chronicle. So TriFed. So that has come up with the Vandan Chronicle and it was launched by the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. So as the name suggests, so it is a chronicle. So it is a list of events that has been occurring. So TriFed Vandan Chronicle is an in-depth resource on the Vandan Yojana and TriFed's activities in this important scheme. So what all the activities are taken up by the tribal ministry and the TriFed is being chronicled here. Then over the past two years, the mechanism for marketing of the minor forest produce through the minimum support price and the development of value chain for the minor forest produce has impacted the tribal ecosystem in a major way. 
So these two schemes we remember that is mechanism for marketing of minor forest produce through the MSPs and development of value chain for the minor forest produce. Then the Vandan tribal startups have emerged as a resource of employment generation for tribals and forest dwellers. So these Vandan tribal startups and all these schemes. So they have been recorded in the Vandan Chronicle. Then come to next about the Trifed. So this Trifed that is the Tribal Cooperative Marketing Development Federation of India. So that was established in 1987 under the Multi-State Cooperative Societies Act 1984. So this is being registered under the Multi-State Cooperative Societies Act. Then this body works for the social and economic development of the tribal people of the country. So here friends many people say that it is a statutory body. So we cannot consider this as a statutory body because there is no specific Trifed Act as such. So just because it is registered under the Multi-State Cooperative Societies Act, so we cannot say that every cooperative societies are statutory bodies. Then it is administered by the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Then it has been registered as a national level cooperative body and it helps tribal people to manufacture the products of national and international markets and on a sustainable basis and also supports the formation of self-help groups and imparting training to them. So all related to the manufacturing and the marketing of tribal goods are being taken care by the Trifed. Then come to next the global additive manufacturing. So friends what is this additive manufacturing it is nothing but the 3D printing. So here in the 3D printing so we print an object layer by layer in the three dimension. So as and when we add the layers that is what is called the additive manufacturing. So here Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology METI that aims to increase the India's share in the global additive manufacturing to 5% within the next three years. And it also hopes that it could likely add $1 billion to the gross domestic product by that time. Then as per the national strategy for additive manufacturing by 2025, India will aim to achieve certain targets such as 50 Indian specific technologies for material machine and software. So under this additive manufacturing, we will be coming up with 50 indigenous technologies and then 100 new startups for additive manufacturing and then 500 new products that were being manufactured by this additive manufacturing technology. So these three targets we try to remember and then in total Mighty hopes that these new startups will give jobs to at least 1 lakh new skilled workers over the next three years of time. So again employment is an offshoot of this technology. And then more about additive manufacturing, 3D printing or additive manufacturing uses computer aided designing to make prototypes or working models of objects by laying down the successive layers. So what we have discussed earlier, so adding layer by layer that prompts to this additive manufacturing. So this additive manufacturing comes with the software where the layer by layer the manufacturing goes on as per the program instructions. So a brief account on global additive manufacturing then come to next the National Stock Exchange of India Limited. Friends NSE was in use because of corruption and other cases. So in that context it becomes important. So it is the leading stock exchange of India and it is located in Mumbai Maharashtra and it is the world's largest derivative exchange in 2021 by the number of contracts traded based on the statistics maintained by the Futures Industry Association. So it is a derivative trade body. So this Futures Industry Association is a derivative trade body and that has kept an account and as per that account. So National Stock Exchange, so that happens to be the largest derivative exchange in the year 2021. Then it is under the ownership of some leading financial institutions, banks and insurance companies. So this National Stock Exchange, Bombay Stock Exchange, all these are private bodies. So private entities, they have come together and they have formed these. Then NSE was established in 1992 as the first dematerialized electronic exchange in the country. So mark this as important, the first DMAT electronic exchange. Then NSE was first exchange in the country to provide a modern, fully automated, screen-based electronic trading system that offered easy trading facilities to the investors of the country. So Bombay Stock Exchange was not that technically advanced when NSE was created. And as far as technology is concerned, so market trend that NSE should come first and then the BSE. So these trends is what which give you hints in the prelims. Then the National Land Monetization Corporation. So UN cabinet has approved setting up of new government owned firm that is the National Land Monetization Corporation for pooling and monetizing sovereign and public sector land assets. 
so it is like the government assets or the public sector lands so they are being pooled and they will be used under this national land monetization corporation so friends we have been hearing about the gold monetization and others so now it is land monetization and the NLMC is being formed with an initial authorized share capital of 5000 crore and the paid up capital of 150 crores. So in the previous classes we have discussed what is a shared capital and the paid up capital. So paid up capital is that which has already paid. So the account contains 150 crores but 5000 crores might be the probable share holdings that might come in future or who might have agreed to pay. Then the government will appoint a chairman to head the NLMC through a merit based selection process and hire private sector professionals with the expertise. Then NLMC will undertake monetization of surplus land and building assets of central public sector enterprises as well as government agencies. Then the new corporation will also help carry out monetization of assets belonging to public sector firms that have closed or are lined up for strategic sale. So once the public sector undertaking is under sale, so the land will be monetized and it will be used for any other purposes. Then the government would be able to generate substantial revenues by monetizing unused and underused assets. So if a company has 100 acres and if it is using only 50 acres, the remaining 50 acres can be made the best use of. So this is a brief account on the NLMC. Then the RBI's $5 billion rupee swap. So here the Reserve Bank of India recently conducted a $5 billion rupee swap auction as a part of its liquidity management initiative. So here the auction has led to the infusion of dollars and sucking out of rupee from the financial system. And this will reduce the pressure on inflation and strengthen the rupee. So for example this is economy and I infused dollars and I sucked out rupee. So once I suck out the rupee the common goods so they will not be inflated. So people will not be having demand to buy the common goods. But when we infuse the dollars, so what happens is like the dollars become cheaper. Friends, if the dollars are costlier, so it is like for one dollar, instead of paying 70 rupees, I will have to pay 80 rupees. So now the dollars are cheaper in the market. So that means instead of 70 rupees per dollar, I am paying 60 rupees per dollar. So that means, so Indian currency got strengthened now. And this is the revaluation of currency which can happen due to the infusion of dollars. Then what happens during the swap option? So we have discussed already just a brief revision. So RBI sold some $5 billion to the banks on March 8 and simultaneously agreed to buy back the dollars to the end. And when the central bank sells dollars, it sucks out the equivalent amount of rupees, thus reducing the rupee liquidity in the system. And dollar inflow into the market will strengthen the rupee which has already hit the 77 level against the dollars. So now the revaluation or the strengthening of rupee happens. Then the swap auction can be done in the reverse way also when there is shortage of liquidity in the system. So when there is shortage of rupee, so RBI can purchase the dollars and it can infuse rupee into the economy. Then RBI then buys the dollars from the market and releases an equal amount in rupees. So just make sure that what happens when the swap occurs. So that is where the UPSC hits the question. Then come to next, the Export Preparedness Index 2021. Niti Ayog in partnership with the Institute of Competitiveness released the Export Preparedness Index 2021. So mark Niti Ayog and the Institute of Competitiveness as important. Then it is a data driven endeavor to identify the fundamental areas critical for the subnational export promotion. So mark this as subnational. So it is like every state are striving for promotion and this export preparedness index is checking the export preparedness of every state. So that is why it is sub-national. So market is important again. Then EPI ranks states and duties on four main pillars. So what are the pillars? One is the comprehensive trade policy. So every state should have a comprehensive trade policy that provides a strategic direction for exports and imports. So every state should have a very good policy for export and imports. Then the efficient business ecosystem. So here the ease of doing business or we can say the ease of export business. So that should be very good. And then export ecosystem. So this pillar aims to assess the business environment which is specific for the exports. So here we can say if we have a good business then we will have a good export environment also. So business environment and export environment they will go hand in hand. 
and then export performance. So this examines the reach of the export footprints of the states and union territories. So where all our exports have gone in the past. So that is the export performance and how it is measured. Then the sub pillars. So here export promotion policy should be there. Then institutional frameworks. So proper bodies, regulators and others. Then business environment. Then proper infrastructure like ports, highways, etc. Connectivity. Then access to finance. So credit availability. Then export infrastructure. And then trade support. And then R&D. Then export diversification. Then growth orientation. So here we have a brief statistics. So starting from 2015-16. To 2019-20 so we had improved till 2018-19 and after that we got down in 2019-20 so might be because of covid so this curve so that is equally applicable for the imported raw materials then import of intermediate goods and also the export of mercantile. friends we know that mercantile is the maximum which we export so even that has been reduced so everything the import as well as export was picking up the pace but COVID-19, it walked them down. Then come to next, the draft data accessibility and use policy. So Mighty again released a policy proposal titled as the draft India data accessibility and use policy 2022. So what are the features? So it prescribes that a regulatory authority called the Indian Data Council and an agency by the name Indian Data Office will oversee the framing of data and the standards and the enforcement of the data respectively. So here we have two bodies that are being set up by this policy that is the Indian Data Council and Indian Data Office. Friends now we know that data is a new oil. So for a better data management at most upgraded technology has to be required and this Indian Data Council and Indian Data Office they are going to promote standardize and maintain those data maintenance technologies. Then the IDC will comprise the IDO and data officers of the five government departments. So various government department officers they will be deputed into this data office. Then the IDO will be constituted by the mighty to streamline and consolidate the data access and sharing across the government and other stakeholders. So here basically we are concentrating on the government data. Then the IDC's tasks will include defining the frameworks for high value data sets and then finalizing the data standards as per the international rules and regulations and then reviewing the implementation of the policies. Then the nomination of departments and the state governments in the IDC will be by rotation with tenure of two years for one department. So officers from every department will go on deputation to the IDC for a tenure of two years and come back. Then each central ministry or department will adopt and publish its domain specific metadata and data standardization. And then the draft policy also looks to provide for the time frame for the government for holding data sets. So all these, the IDC, IDO, and then the deputation, and then the standardization. So all these are embedded in this policy. Then the small value digital payment in offline mode. So the Reserve Bank of India has come out with a framework for facilitating small value digital payments in the offline mode, a move that would promote digital payments in semi-urban and rural areas. So what is this offline and how it works? An offline digital payment does not require internet or telecom connectivity. Under this new framework, such payments can be carried out face to face using a channel or instrument like cards, wallets and mobile devices. Friends, it is like by sending the SMSs, we can transact. So instead of going for the phone pay, Paytm, etc. I will send you a message saying that give me 5 rupees and you will authorize that. So 5 rupees will be debited from your account and will be credited to my account. And such transactions would not require an additional factor of authentication. So here there is no internet connectivity and the factor of authentication will not arise at all. So this is taken as advantage but it also comes with a disadvantage that the lack of security. And since the transactions are offline, so alerts by way of SMSs will be received by the customers after a time lag. So after you transact, it will be accounted and intimated to you. Then there is a limit of 200 per transaction and an overall limit of 2000 until the balance in the account is replenished. And RBI said the framework took effect immediately. So from now on, we can do this small value digital payments in the offline mode. So remember the limits and also that offline mode. So that is more than sufficient for UPSC. Then come to next, the green energy corridor phase two. 
So the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved the scheme on the Green Energy Corridor Phase 2 for the intrastate transmission systems. And here it will facilitate grid integration and power evacuation of approximately 20 gigawatt of renewable energy power projects in seven states namely Gujarat, Himachal, Karnataka, Kerala, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. And this will help in achieving the target of 450 gigawatt installed renewable energy capacity by 2030. So this will help in reaching the renewable energy targets. So friends here this green energy corridor so that will create or set up some of the projects for renewable energy might be the solar plants, wind energy or anything for that matter. And not only that, once the energy is generated, so the power will be evacuated. So some 20 gigawatt of power will be generated and it will be evacuated and it will be transmitted to the grids situated in various places of the nation. Then it will contribute to long term energy security. So what obvious then it will generate large direct and indirect employment opportunities. So all these are the users. So they cannot define what the corridor actually is. So corridor actually does what we discussed right now that is generation of energy and transmission of energy without losses. Then come to next FRDI bill. So in order to deal with the insolvency of firms in the financial sector, the finance ministry has recently sought views of the RBI on drafting a modified version of financial resolution and deposit insurance bill. So we know that the parliament had passed the FRDI bill in 2017. But however, this was withdrawn in 2018. So now they are coming up with a new modifications in the bill. And this bill was meant to address the issue of insolvency of the firms in the financial sector with the least disruptions to the system and other stakeholders. Say for example, if a bank went bankrupt. So how to resolve that? How to replenish the money? And what payment would be given for the depositors of that bank? So all this was dealt by this bill. But however, this bill was controversial because some key point of criticism was the so-called bail-in clause. So what is this bail-in clause? It is that if a bank becomes insolvent, so the depositors, so they have to contribute something for the losing bank. Say for example, I have deposited 5 lakh. So if the bank is bankrupt, so I have to agree with the 3 lakh and 2 lakh, I will absorb it for the bank. And this was unjust because bank is utilizing my hard-earned money for its mal administration. So the bank incurred loss due to its mal administration and why it should extort the depositors money for its mistake. And now the new modified version. So that aims to avoid the utilization of depositors money for the insolvency processes. And also it says that not only for the 1 lakh, now we will be having the insurance cover for the 5 lakh. So earlier in the 2017 bill, there was insurance cover only for 1 lakh deposit. And now if I keep 5 lakh deposit for all the 5 lakhs, I will be getting insurance. So that means earlier if I had kept 4 lakh, so only for 1 lakh there was insurance. So that means if the bank incurs loss, I'll get only 1 lakh and the 3 lakh are gone. And now it is like 5 lakh is the minimum insurance. So if I keep 15 lakh, I will get 5 lakh for sure and the remaining 10 lakh, they are gone. And however, before the bill comes, the government should make sure that the depositors money is not harmed in any case of insolvency procedures that undergo for a bank. Then come to next, the government steps for the growth of MSMEs. So here we have so many schemes. First is the Udyami Mitra portal. So that was launched by the SIDB to improve accessibility of credit and handholding services to MSME. So mark SIDB as important and that will give the financial and other strengths for the MSMEs. Then MSME Sambandh. So this was set up to monitor the implementation of the public procurement from the MSMEs by the CPSEs. So friends, several public sector undertakings, so they are purchasing the raw materials from the MSMEs. So that is monitored by this MSME Sambans. Then the MSME Samadhan. So as the name suggests, that is the delayed payment portal. So that means if a public sector undertaking or the government ministry, so if they are procuring something from the MSMEs, and if they don't pay their dues, so the grievance redressal mechanism for MSMEs will be dealt by this Samadhan portal. Then the digital MSME scheme. So this involves the usage of cloud computing where the MSMEs use the internet to access the common as well as a tailor-made IT infrastructure. So if there is any IT based MSME, so they can go for this cloud computing rather than setting up individual servers. Then the revamped scheme for the regeneration of the traditional industries that is the S4T. 
So here, this scheme organizes traditional industries and artisans into clusters and makes them competitive by enhancing their marketability and equipping them with improved skills. So here overall, it is like the traditional industries. So the textile industries, the blacksmith, so all these, so they are catered to and the skills are being updated and more quality goods are being produced with the government support. Then the scheme for promoting innovation, rural industry and entrepreneurship, that is the ASPIRE. So this ASPIRE scheme, so that will promote MSMEs in the rural areas and so that the skill development, then employment, entrepreneurial skills, so all these will be developed. Then come to next, the National Manufacturing Competitiveness Program. So this is to develop the global competitiveness among the Indian MSMEs by improving their processes, designs and technology and market access. Then the Micro and Small Enterprises Cluster Development Program. So this helps in developing clusters where the MSMEs belonging to one sector, they can come manufacture and make profit and give employment. Then the credit linked capital subsidy scheme. So some money are given as a capital and that is given with the subsidized interest rate. So that is what the credit linked capital subsidies. So these are some of the programs for the MSMEs. Then the design linked incentive scheme. So this scheme aims to provide financial and infrastructural support to the companies setting up fabs or semiconductor making plants in India. So basically whoever are setting the electronic hardware companies in India, for them the incentives are being given under this design linked incentive scheme. And this aims to support expenditure related to design software, then intellectual property rights, then development testing and deployment of various electronic hardwares. Then CDAC, that is the Center for Development of advanced computing so will serve as the nodal agency for implementation of the DLI scheme. So mark CDAC as the nodal agency then the components of the scheme. The first one the chip design infrastructure support. CDAC will set up the India chip center to host the state of the art design infrastructure and facilitate its access to supported companies. So that means so it is going to set up an India chip center and whatever R&D goes on there. So that will be disseminated for other companies also. Then the production design link incentive. So here a reimbursement of up to 50% of the eligible expenditure subject to a ceiling of 15 crore. So either 15% or 15 crore whichever is less. So this is given as incentive if I am coming up with good production and the deployment link incentive. So here an incentive of 6% to 4% of the net sales turnover over 5 years subject to a ceiling of 30 crores. So whichever is less. So if 6% is less, it is 6%. If 30 crore is less, it is 30 crore. So that is also given if our company is performing well over the past 5 years. Then come to next, the PLI scheme for the white goods, then specialty steel and others. So here PLI scheme for white goods shall extend to an incentive of 6% to 4% on incremental sale of goods manufactured in India for a period of 5 years. So very similar to the design link incentive scheme. So friends, the PLA scheme, if it is extended for IT hardware, so but obvious it becomes the design link incentive scheme. And it applies to the companies engaged in manufacturing of air conditioners and the LED lights. So mark these as white goods. So ACs, then LEDs are called the white goods. So they are used for a basically luxury life. Then an entity availing benefits under any other PLI scheme, so they will not be eligible for this scheme. So one industry will enjoy the incentive only under one sector under this production link incentive scheme. Then the PLI for the specialty steel. So here the duration of the scheme is from 2023-24 to 2027-28. So five years duration and there are three slabs of PLI incentives under this scheme. That is the lowest being the 4% and the highest being 12% which has been provided for the electrical steel. So here we have various categories of steel friends. For the basic category of steel, 4% of incentives are given over a period of 5 years. And for the highest quality steel, 12% of incentive is given. And here the 5 categories of specialty steel that have been chosen in the PLI scheme are that is the coated or plated steel and then the high strength steel or the wear resistant steel, then specialty rails, then alloy steel products and steel wires and electrical steel. 
and specialty steel is value added steel wherein the normal finished steel is worked upon by way of coating plating and heat treatments so for these five products of specialty steel so the various slabs of incentives are being given under the production link incentive scheme then come to next the national automobile scrappage policy so scrappage policy will encourage fuel efficient environment friendly vehicles on the road thereby it will reduce the vehicular pollution and oil import bill so key features under the policy vehicles would undergo fitness tests after a certain period of time that is in case of personal vehicles so fitness test will be for every 20 years and for commercial vehicles it is for every 15 years that each fitness test will cost approximately rupees 40000 other than that world vehicles will have to pay green tax and the road tax so if you disincentivize so then scrappage policy will be easy then if a vehicle fails for a fitness test it will not get a renewal certificate and won't be able to run on the road however if it passes a fitness test the vehicle will have to undergo a fitness test every 5 years so for world vehicles every 5 years the fitness test should go then the aim of all these costs is to discourage the consumers from keeping the older vehicles and the incentives for vehicle scrappage not announced yet so mark this as important so although it sounds to be extreme it is factually correct so these are some of the points of discussion today then coming to the last part friends what might be the government incentive given what might be the credit given so all these are given for the hard work so that means the hard work and dedication so these are the only two things which can lead to the success be it a person or a nation or a community for that matter so hard work and dedication can take a nation from as shabby as a poorest nation to a most industrialized state so the same way a person can grow from penury to the billionaire given the hard work and dedication so make these two values as yours and come out with the flying colors all the very best good luck friend <laughs>